Well, we are continuing our series and really wrapping up our series, Imperfect People, uh, Moved by the Perfect Love of Jesus. And uh, we're, we got two more weeks left. We've been talking about these marks of a disciple, a follower of Jesus that, that we want for everybody in this room, individually and collectively, to have these marks. If you wonder, maybe you're new to our church, maybe you've been around at our church, maybe you're brand new to Jesus, maybe you've been following Jesus since you were a little kid. If you wonder, why we do everything we do, like why we do every event we do, why we call you to serve, read your Bible, love your spouse, love your neighbor, love your friend. Why do we do all of that? It's these seven things. We are trying to build in you by the power of the Spirit, this gospel identity, this biblical framework, this spirit reliance, this generous stewardship where we give generously as a body of Christ. All these things, if you missed any of those, go back and watch them because they are pivotal for us as a church to understand, hey, what's the goal of all of this? It's not just a religious ritual, amen? We're trying to see us go somewhere as a people collectively as Phoenix Bible Church. And these seven marks are what those things are. And today, we're talking about this mark of renewing rest. Now, as I studied renewing rest, as I think about renewing rest, I think we kind of tend to fall into one extreme or the other with rest. Some of us were on this extreme, even as you hear me talk about rest and we're going to preach about rest, you immediately get kind of defensive because you just think, Tim, rest is unrealistic. I mean, you don't know my job, my, my position, like, hold on, let me show you my business card, like, I'm important. And rest may be easy for you, Tim, because you work like, what, one day a week? <laughs> and you like pray the rest of the time, right? That's all I do. I know some of you are thinking, that's okay. And so, but, but for me, like my business card, my desk, my, my people I lead, like it's unrealistic for me to rest. Or maybe some of you, you go even further and you're like, no, no, like I just think rest is for wimps. Like, people that want to rest, like, they don't get anything done. Like, Tim, I'll rest when I die. Like, I got things to do in life. I'm going and blowing. And that's you're just kind of an ambition, type, ambitious type A person. And maybe some of you fall into that extreme. But I think the other side of the spectrum is we fall into extreme of, like, some of you, like, when you think about rest, you're, you're like, yes. My kind of sermon. Like, you don't say amen to any other sermon, but you're like, preach it, Pastor. Bring the word. I need some rest. Like I need to tell my boss, I'm going to have him listen to this sermon. He's not even a Christian. But he needs to listen to this. Like I'm, I'm all in this. Like your life motto is Hakuna Matata. Your, your core values in life are like naps and Netflix. And oh yeah, binging and scrolling. You're just like, man, I, this is who I am. Like I need some rest. I love these kind of sermons. And what I would tell you is that extreme is not what the Bible teaches either that there's a different option than those two extremes. And it's what we've entitled renewing rest. In fact, we, we gave it a definition. If you take notes, you can write this down. This is what we mean by rest. This is what we want for your life and for our church. It's this, that you would set aside intentional time weekly for, there's the word Sabbath, mark it on your worksheet, rest and worship. That's what we mean by my renewing rest. So I just want to spend a few moments today breaking that down. We're going to look at a few different verses. You can follow along on the screen with me, or you can do like sword drills with your Bible and try to head to everyone. I, I challenge you on that. See if you take the challenge. And here's our first point, if you do take notes, it's this. Is you don't just need renewing rest, you are wired for it. You don't just need renewing rest, you're, you're literally wired for it. Rest. Here's where we see that. Genesis chapter 2, read along with me, verse 2 through 3. It says this, And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Genesis, the very beginning of our Bibles, if you notice, you see God do something extraordinary. He rests. Now, why is that extraordinary? Because God didn't need to rest. Right? God spoke creation into being. Hebrews tells us he's sustaining all of the universe by the power of his very word. Does God need to rest? The answer is no. Right? Why does he rest? 
He's weaving into creation. He's wiring into you from the very onset of all time, this rhythm of rest. You work six days and then you rest. You work, then you rest. That, that's the rhythm of the universe. And that's the rhythm of your life from creation. This, that, that is why every day around 7 p.m., you see the same thing every day, even in Phoenix where it's always sunny. You see around 7 p.m., what starts to happen? God turns the lights out. The sun starts to set. Why? Because God instituted a rhythm. It's woven into the very fabric of how the universe should function. It's woven into the very fabric as you see the lights go out, as you see the sun start to set. You're meant to be reminded that the way you are wired is to work and then rest, work and then rest. That there is a pattern to life. And here's the reality. And many of you know this reality all too well, all too painfully well in your life. If you don't follow the rhythm God instituted in all of creation and into you, if you don't follow that, things start to break, don't they? I mean, physically, things start to break. Like some of you, it's, it's summertime, it's pool time, and you're trying to get in shape, right? Some of you, like, dad bod is turning into summer bod. Like, in the name of Jesus, it's going to happen. And you're looking up all the workout plans and all the reading plans, and you're like, what do I do? And what do they all say? Hey, get sleep. Hey, you need like seven to eight hours, maybe more of sleep. You can eat all the right things, a doctor will tell you. you. You can do all the right workouts. But if you don't just get this sleep... Things are going to go bad for you. It's not just that you're going to not get that summer bod. Your blood pressure is going to spike. You, you may have heart issues over time. You're going to have mental and emotional health issues. Why is it like that? Why does your body begin to break down if you don't rest? Because God set up a pattern. He, he wove into the very fabric of our universe and to your body that you have to rest. And so you can be one of those kind of crazy people like John Gruden, old football reference, where he's like, not me, like I sleep four hours a night. Like I'm, I'm the exception to the rule. Okay, we'll see. We'll see. Let's see you fight up against the universe and see how long you survive. And nobody does because your body's wired to rest. Your phone is wired to rest. Right? It's why it's when, when your phone is glitching or your apps don't work right and you go into the iPhone store and you, you go up to the Genius Bar and you say, hey, man, I don't know what to do. This thing's just not working right. What's the first troubleshooting question that they ask you? When's the last time you restarted it? When's the last time you turned it off? And some of you are like, I don't know, like 2016? <laughs> what year is it? Why would I turn my phone off? It's like my IV drip keeping me alive. But it will break if it doesn't rest. See, we, we all, if we think about it, we, we see this sort of rhythm, this wiring in us and in creation that we are designed to rest. And if we don't do that, things do not go well. Listen, we have a, a video that our own Danica, our kids director, and Marco, our youth director, are in to, to show you that, to put that on display. So would you turn your attention to the screen real quick?
you guys. How are you so calm right now? Don't you know it's family Sunday? Well, I just have my Sabbath. What Sabbath? Awesome. Can you give it up for those guys? Did such a good job. So, so you can see from their experience, like things don't work well if you don't rest. And what God did is he didn't just create rest, he commands it. And that is the, the Sabbath. And so that's what we're going to look at next. Exodus 20, uh, verses 8 through 11. This is the fourth commandment. And it says this. God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day, it's a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. Basically, nobody is exempt from this Sabbath command. Verse 11, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So we want to ask that question that Marco and Danica asked. What is Sabbath? Well, quite literally, it means a full stop. But it's not just the absence of work. It's also the presence of God. If you looked at those verses, look at them with me. Verse 8 says, keep the Sabbath holy. That word holy just means to set it apart unto God. So this rest that you are to experience in life should be absent from work, but it also should include, pretty vitally include, the presence of God set apart unto God. That's why in verse 10 it says that the Sabbath is unto the Lord. It's not unto you. It's not unto like your, your friends. It's unto God. It's meant to honor God and include God in every aspect of this Sabbath rest. But here's what's interesting. I think as you look at books about the Christian life, as you go to churches, and even I remember growing up in church and hearing sermons, I didn't include Sabbath rest as part of an integral foundational component of my Christian life. In fact, I thought it was kind of optional. I thought about a lot of other things, and I heard about a lot of other things all the time. Like, hey, as a Christian, here's what you need to do. Read your Bible, right? We need to get up early in the morning, stay up late at night, whatever the case may be. We need to memorize scripture. Like as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, you need to read your Bible. Oh, but you also, you need to pray, right? You also need to share your faith because there's people lost and dying and going to hell. You need to do that. As a Christian, you need to serve. Like sign up to serve in kids' ministry. Invest in the next generation. Like you need to give even. We've heard that. Like you need to tithe and, and give generously. As a Christian, that's what you're supposed to do if you're growing in your relationship with Christ. And yet how many times have you heard, hey, one of the key elements of all of those things is Sabbath rest. I didn't really hear that. Even as we built these seven marks, uh, we kind of almost left this one out. Because it almost just seems like this idea of renewing rest or Sabbath is like this separate thing from the Christian life. It's like this bonus. Like if I get around to that, if I, if I, if I uh, have time for that. Or we see it as like, well, Tim, for me, like the way I really rest is like I get a glass of bourbon and I just kind of numb my pain from the day and that's not keeping it set apart for the Lord, but that's the way you rest. But it's not rest, it's really escape or it's numbing. And you just kind of see it, it's almost like, hey, I do my Christian life, I go to church, I read my Bible, I pray, I share my faith, serve, and then there's over here, whatever your version of rest is, vacation. What's the problem with that? Well, there's several, but the main one is the Bible, right? The Bible gives us these 10 commandments, this foundational list of, hey, here's what it means to relate to God. Here's what it means to relate to other people. And the fourth commandment is Sabbath rest. And if you actually read the Ten Commandments, what's really interesting is the first three, you can really summarize as one, and it's this. It's worship God alone. Don't have any other gods. Don't speak his name in vain. Hey, worship God as, as, as your only uh, object of your worship. And then the, the first practical commandment about anything else, it's not about adultery. It's not about stealing. It's not about killing. Very important things, amen? 
What's it about? Sabbath rest? And yet we've, we've set it aside. we made it separate. we made it optional when God seems to think it's foundational. And see, you have to put yourself in the context of Exodus 20 and the Israelites. See, as they get this command, this, this, this longest commandment of the Ten Commandments, hey, rest, you need to rest. You need to know this was foundational for them. You see, they had been slaves for upwards of 400 years. About half a million people, the Israelites, had been enslaved in Egypt. This is all that they knew, was being enslaved, was working. All their stories from, from grandpappy were all about work. None of them included rest at all. None of them had ever experienced that. In fact, as you look at Exodus chapter 5, what's really interesting is Exodus 5 is Moses and Aaron. The first time that they go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go like Charlton Heston in the movie, right? If you actually read the Bible, it doesn't make it into the movie, but what they say in the Bible, Exodus chapter five, go look it up, is not free my people forever. What they say is, hey, can our people take a few days to rest and to worship our God in the wilderness? And what you see is not only Pharaoh say no to that, but he's enraged by that because he thinks, who are you to ask for rest? You're my slaves. In fact, you know what? Now that you asked for that, and this is what Exodus 5 paints a picture of, now that you asked for that, Moses, guess what? Things aren't going to get better. They're not even going to stay the same. They're going to get worse. You see, he'd been giving them straw to make brick. That was what they were doing day and night. They were making this brick out of this straw. And he says, you know what's going to happen now since you asked for rest? I'm going to give you more work. You have to go gather your own straw, and you still have to meet the same quota. See, what, what Pharaoh was so bothered by was not that Moses asked to set the people free. It was that he simply asked for, for rest. Can you put yourself in those shoes of the Israelites? You see, God is teaching in the fourth commandment, why is it the longest? Why is it the first practical commandment? Why is it in this foundational list of what it means to follow God and relate to other people? Because God is teaching them how to do something they've never done before. They've never even heard stories about in their family. They don't have any traditions they can look back to. In fact, they have a lot of pain associated when they just ask to rest. And so God says, hey, I'm going to make this abundantly clear. This is foundational. This is essential. It is not optional. It is a command, but it's also a gift. Can you just imagine the Israelites in that moment, seeing it on the stone tablets? We get to rest. After all these years, we get to do that? We get to have Sabbath rest? You see, it's foundational to what it means to follow God to love one another, to rest. So here's my question for you. Do you see rest that way? Or do you see it as optional, bonus, if I get around to it, Netflix and napping? Or do you, do you see it as essential in your faith? Because God made it pretty clear it's essential, amen? It's not optional, it's essential, it's foundational. Do you see it that way in your life? Here's our third point and our last point. Renewing rest isn't situational, it's relational. Renewing rest isn't situational, it's relational. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 11. He said it this way. He said, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. See, Jesus gives us the recipe for rest. But again, it's interesting. If you contrast what Jesus says about how to get rest with what our culture says about how to get rest, they're very different, aren't they? As you think about your own life, how do you think about rest? Well, it's... Tim, it's when I, I, I'm resigning from this job, and then, uh, then I'm just going to get more sustainability in my life and more balance, work-life balance and rest. Or Tim, it's, you know, I have two weeks off coming up. I'm going to Cabo San Lucas, and I'm going to rest, baby. I can't wait. Situational. Nothing to do with 
You thinking about Jesus in Cabo San Lucas? No, you're not. Like, come on. We think situational. We think, hey, when my kids get out of this phase, when they start sleeping at night, when they stop teething, then I'm going to rest. Some of you, it's like you have teenagers, and you're like, hey, when they stop just being weird, I'm going to rest. Some of you are like just more honest. You're like, man, when my kids get out of the house, I'm going to rest. And you talk about it with your spouse, and you all dream about it and have all these visions about what you're going to do. Some of you have adult children who don't follow Jesus and don't like you very much and don't come around very much. And you think, man, when they turn around, somebody's going to show you, Holy Spirit, you pray for them every day. And you're like, one day they're going to come back, family dinner, it's going to happen. They're going to follow Jesus. They're going to stop hating me. And then I'm going to rest. And for you, rest is all situational and it's never relational. And did you read what Jesus just said? D- did you read it? He says, Hey, here's how you get rest. Here's the recipe for rest. Come to me. Take my yoke. Learn from me. And this is how you find rest for your very soul. It's all relational. It has nothing to do with situational. Do, do you see that the, the point of renewing rest is getting more of Jesus Christ? That's, that's what it all boils down to. If you're like, Tim, how do I get more rest? I'm trying these strategies. I'm trying by myself. Have you looked to the Savior? How are you involving him in your plan for rest, your desire for rest? Is he nowhere to be found? But re- realistically, it's all about Netflix and maybe some uh, um, essential oils and maybe some kale. And you're like, that's how I'm going to get rest. But Jesus Christ, well, that's kind of, I read my Bible, Tim. That's, no, is he involved in your rest? He's the whole point of it. He's how you get it. So here's a, here's a good test for us all in this room, wherever we are today. Here's a good test. Are you getting more of Jesus in your life right now? Like in your life, are you getting more of Jesus in your life? Are you getting closer and closer to Jesus in your life. Right now, 2022, Memorial Day weekend, are you getting closer to Jesus? Are you growing in your relationship with Jesus Christ? Are you trusting in, obeying, falling more in love with Jesus Christ? Listen, if the answer is no to that, then maybe you are too busy. Maybe you're too distracted. You're like, no, Tim, it's, it's, the, it's this other sin and it's this other thing right now. Okay, maybe it's that too. But what if you just looked at your life practically and said, I, I'm not growing in Christ. I'm too busy for Christ. You see, what's interesting, there's an author named John Mark Comer. He wrote a book on rest that I would highly recommend to you. It's called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And he kind of looks at scripture and he talks about how how love and hurry do not mix. They're like oil and water. We say to our staff all the time, like, you can't cheat time. And what I mean by that is what we do in ministry, like our jobs are with you people. And we want to love you. And that takes time. We want you to trust God. And that takes time. And, And the reality is loving God and loving neighbor takes time. Love and hurry don't mix. Jean-Marc Comer also talks about that as you look at the imagery in Scripture of what it means to relate to God, what you see is this common imagery of simply just walking with God, walking by the Spirit, taking steps with God. What you don't see is a frenetic, running relationship with God. That's not the imagery Scripture paints for us. And so many of us, I'm going to give you some practical steps of what it looks like to have renewing rest. But the first step that's not on the slide is maybe you need to repent of your busyness. Maybe you need to repent of being so distracted every moment, looking at your phone, checking your email. And it's inhibiting your relationship with Jesus. And so maybe the first thing, that's what repentance means, is you need to turn from that. You need to go a new direction in life. I know that was me this week. As I studied this, it studied me. Because I had to look at my life and say, am I as close to Jesus as I want to be? Am I getting more of Jesus? Am I growing in my relationship with Jesus? 
No. And a big part of that is I'm too busy. And if I can do that as a pastor, what about you? Do you need to repent of busyness and distraction in your life keeping you from following Jesus? I think that's a lot of us in this room. Amen? That's where we need to start. And then once we've done that, here's three quick things as we close. You need to be intentional. Uh, Remember our definition. We set aside time weekly for Sabbath rest and worship. What does Sabbath look like in your life? And we can debate, like, well, are we really under the the fourth commandment? Because we're under grace. We're not under law, Tim. We're New Testament believers, not Old Testament believers. And you need to know, that's just silly. Like, that's silly if that's our response. Do you you want me to backtrack to Exodus and see what a gift this commandment is? We shouldn't debate it. We should accept the gift, open up the gift, and set a 24-hour Sabbath in our life. Amen? What does that look like for you? Do you have that time set aside? Are you intentional with that time? Is it set apart unto the Lord? Do you have like a do not disturb feature on your phone for that time? Do you have a a time and a place like I'm going to read scripture, I'm going to pray during that time, I'm going to listen to these sorts of things, I'm going to engage these kinds of people who who fill up my my soul, I'm going to come to Jesus, I'm going to take off my yoke and my religion and my effort and my striving and straining, I'm going to take that off and all that earning and I'm going to receive the grace of Jesus. And I'm going to do that from Friday night to Saturday night. And we're going to go to the park as a family. We're going to eat dinner. Do you have this kind of intentional plan in your life? Listen, you have to be intentional. You have to work in order to rest. That's the rhythm. Six days you work and then you rest. Six days you work and then you rest. Do you have an intentional rhythm of Sabbath rest in your life? You need one. The second thing is be intentional. The second thing is be quiet. Jesus had this rhythm of community and then quiet. Community, he was with crowds, community all the time. But then he went to a a desolate place. He went into the wilderness, away from everyone, and he was quiet. Do you have that kind of rhythm in your life? When When your feet hit the floor in the morning, do you immediately grab your phone? Do you immediately let the news of the day start to inform and affect your life and shape your your heart and mind? You know that's what it's doing to you, right? Do you listen to everything else? Do you listen to your own voice before you listen to the voice of God? Be quiet. Be around people, community, but then have some quiet. The last thing, be present. You know, Jesus was the son of God, and he had a mission to rescue people out of sin, to bring the kingdom of God on the earth. And Jesus did that eternal, life-changing, world-shaping mission, what what would take anybody else a lifetime and multiple lifetimes, Jesus did that in just three years of public ministry. Do you think, you can answer, do you think Jesus was busy? Do you think the Son of God was busy? Yes. Yes. And yet he had time for people. Mark chapter 5. Jesus is is like juggling, he's multitasking like different people who need to be healed. And and there's this one person who needs to be healed. They're about to die. Like it's really really serious, Jesus. And so he's rushing with his disciples. And some of you know the story. This woman comes up and she just touches the bottom of his coat. And his disciples are like, hey, we ain't got time for that, Jesus. And Jesus, what does he do? He stops. And he's fully present with that lady. And he still goes on to do what he's doing. Are you present? Do you have intentionality with being present in life? Uh, There was, I I read this story about these Irish men sitting in a bar long ago and they were arguing, debating, what's the best music? What's the best song? What's the best genre? What's the best musician? And they were debating back and forth and one of them interrupted and said, you know what the best music is? It's the music of the moment. It's the music of what's happening right now. Because we never get this moment back. We get this moment while we have this moment. Did you know God's presence, you know where it is? It's in the present. Not in your worries about tomorrow. Not in what you did yesterday and how you screwed up yesterday and sinned yesterday. God's presence is 
So where should we be? In the present. Be present. Maybe you do need to have a different relationship with your phone. Maybe you, maybe you need to like have like a DTR with your phone. Define the relationship. Things have gotten too serious. You're married and you, you need to break up with your phone. Maybe you need to, like, your multitasking that you think is so effective and so beneficial, and you're like, I just dominate. Like, you know, Tim, like, how I can juggle all these things. Maybe you need to reassess that and think, are you disobeying the fourth commandment as you do that? Are, are, you, are you dismissing people in your life as you do that? When your kid runs up to you, hey, dad, 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 I want to show you this. And you're like, uh-huh. What is it, son? Oh, that's beautiful. You're the best. How are you dismissing your kid, your spouse? Maybe, maybe some of you need to take the, some things out of your life so you can be present in your life with the people in your life so you can experience renewing rest. Listen, here's, here's the goal over our time today. is not just to get some neat facts about rest. It's to start experiencing renewing rest in your life so that you are more trusting in God. That, that's what it's about. That, that's why we want this for our church, that, that we have a, have a church that's more trusting in God, that gives away some of our time because we're not in control and we acknowledge he's in control, amen? That's, that's the goal. It's not, I know some of us were like, Tim, I'm feeling so guilty right now. Like, me too. But that's not the goal. The goal is to get more of Jesus. Go to him. Take his yoke upon you. And these are some ways we can do that. And listen, it's not because we don't want to get things done. I believe as a church who wants to see people radically change for Jesus all across our city and beyond, we can actually get more done as we rest, as we operate in the rhythm of how God created us to function. I think we should go, to the way, the, way the, the person who created everything, I think we should follow his rhythm, not ours. Amen. That's the point, to get more of Jesus through the process. Amen? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for this gift of Sabbath rest. God, I pray that for us individually, I pray for us collectively, that we would start to experience that rest. That we would remove some things in our life. We would add some things in our life. We would have a, a sit down with our phone, with our wife, with our kids, and just lay out some new rhythms and patterns so that we can get more done by, by, by actually stopping occasionally, so that we can get more of you. Uh, Jesus, I thank you that you lived the life that we could never live, and you died the death that we deserved on the cross, and you rose again in victory. You, you literally said, it is finished, so we could stop striving and earning and so that we could rest in Jesus. Thank you for that gift. We, we celebrate that gift today, and we, we want to walk in that gift by the power of your spirit. Help us to do that in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen.